Hello, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and I'm going to be talking about the fake comatoses. Here are my disclaimers. I've always wanted to be a shameless tool of industry, but nobody will pay to support me. Let's talk about some general considerations for the fake comatoses. Overall, they're quite common. In fact, neurofibromatosis type 1 is the third most common autosomal dominant disorder. The phacomatoses tend to be progressive. Lesions may grow and or appear to increase in number as the patient ages. Some lesions may transform. A neurofibroma can become a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. In general, annual clinical surveillance and imaging every couple of years are suggested even when patients are asymptomatic. Most phacomatoses have cutaneous findings, but von Hippel-Lindau disease does not. Most are caused by germline mutations, but Sturge-Weber syndrome is not inherited. Our educational objectives. We want to be able to describe why NF1 is truly characterized by multiple neurofibromas. We want to talk about three neoplasms that are caused by the chromosome 22 mutation that causes neurofibromatosis type 2. We want to be able to explain why tuberous sclerosis is a disorder of neuronal migration. We want to define the vascular malformation of Sturge-Weber disease or Sturge-Weber syndrome. And we want to be able to describe the central nervous system and visceral manifestations of von hippel disease. This is just a chart summarizing the abbreviations for the diseases, their birth incidence, mode of inheritance, which gene and chromosome is involved, and the prominent and important clinical features for each of the syndromes we're going to be discussing today. Why should we study phacomatoses? They're common diseases. They're diagnosed by imaging. There are important genetic implications. In fact, all the diseases we're talking about today are autosomal dominant, with the exception of Sturge-Weber disease. If we identify an affected individual, we should screen all their first-degree relatives to see if they are similarly affected. And we have to have a prospective plan for surveillance of the affected individuals. A very wise Greek man once said that the beginning of understanding is definitions. So let's turn to Dorland's Medical Dictionary, where we learn that the term phacomatosis was coined in 1920 by a Dutch ophthalmologist. In Dorland's, it says that phacomatosis comes from the Greek word phacos, meaning mother spot, and describes it as an ophthalmologic term for any of four inherited syndromes neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, and cephalotrigeminal angiomatosis, which are characterized by disseminated hamartomas of the eye, skin, and brain. But Dorland's medical dictionary is incorrect. Serge Weber disease is not inherited. Von Hippel-Lindau disease has no cutaneous findings. And many of the lesions that we see in these syndromes are neoplasms rather than being hamartomas. So all I want to say about the Dutch ophthalmologist is, thank you very much. The critical clinical features of these diseases are the presence of obvious cutaneous stigmata that allow them to be recognized in a clinical setting. And these diseases were defined long before there was medical imaging. I have a memory tool that I use, but you can make one of your own to understand the features of these different diseases. Neurofibromatosis type 1 is truly characterized by forming multiple cutaneous and also central and peripheral nervous system neurofibromas. Neurofibromatosis type 2 is best described as bilateral vestibular schwannoma syndrome, or the MISMI acronym, which we'll describe later in the lecture. Tuberous sclerosis, this is a disease primarily characterized by lesions which are hamartomas, a disorganized arrangement of cells that belong in the organ in which they appear. Sturge-Weber syndrome is a venous malformation and it is not inherited as a germline mutation. And von Hippel-Lindau disease is primarily characterized by the presence of multiple central nervous system hemangioblastomas associated with visceral cysts and neoplasms, but no prominent cutaneous findings. Let's begin with the most common phacomatosis and the best known, 
neurofibromatosis type 1, or von Recklinghausen's disease. This is characterized by multiple cutaneous neurofibromas and cafe au lait macules, optic pathway gliomas, spinal and paraspinal neurofibromas, duralectasia, including lateral thoracic meningocele's, a number of signal abnormalities seen in the basal ganglia and dentate nucleus on MR, the potential for malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. These patients also can produce pheochromocytomas, so NF1 is a type of multiple endocrine neoplasia disease, and a number of vascular lesions have been reported, including aneurysms, coarctation of the aorta, and renal artery stenosis. They're caused by a mutation on chromosome 17. The birth incidence of NF1 is approximately 1 in 2,500 live births. The prevalence is approximately 1 in 3,500, and there is no sexual predilection. As mentioned earlier, it's the third most common autosomal dominant disease. And every cell that is affected inherits a germline mutation, but there is also a second somatic mutation that deletes the remaining copy of the tumor suppressor gene, allowing the expression of the disease, including the development of neoplasia. The NF1 clinical diagnosis criteria from the NIH requires two items from this list. Cathiole spots or macules, six or more in number, and five millimeters in a child and 15 millimeters in diameter in an adult. The size criteria allow these macules to be distinguished from actinic or sun-related freckles. Neurofibromas, two or more, or one complex or infiltrating plexiform neurofibroma. Axillary or other skin fold freckling. Optic pathway gliomas. The Lish nodule, named as you know after Dr. Nodule. Any one of a number of distinctive bone lesions, including pseudoarthrosis and sphenoid dysplasia and a first-degree relative known to have the same disorder. If we turn our attention to the orbital and ocular findings, the Lish nodules are hamartomas that appear on the iris. Their penetrance is greater than 90% in patients with the chromosome 17 mutation that causes NF1, and their specificity is greater than 90% for patients who have two or more of the Lish nodules. They're translucent, or pigmented, and they're generally relatively small, usually less than three millimeters in diameter. A slit lamp examination is the best way to look for these as they can be easily missed when they are not pigmented. The second feature that we look for in the orbit is the presence of optic pathway gliomas. These are pilocytic astrocytomas, and if you remember, the pilocytic astrocytoma is a circumscribed glioma that almost invariably shows contrast enhancement. However, unlike the pilocytic astrocytomas that occur in the cerebellar hemisphere, we usually don't see a prominent cystic component when they arise in the optic nerve or the optic pathways. These may occur in up to 15% of patients, and they behave in a very indolent fashion. In fact, even though they are true neoplasms, they have been shown to have spontaneous growth arrests and even spontaneous regression towards the end of the second decade. Because of their benign clinical characteristics, they are oftentimes left in place as long as the child has preserved vision in that eye. About one half of all uh, optic nerve gliomas in childhood occur in patients who have the NF1. These lesions typically cause expansion of the intraconal portion of the optic nerve. They're much less likely to involve the chiasm or the postchiasmatic components of the optic pathways. About 50 to 80 percent of childhood optic nerve gliomas occur as a distinctive part of von Recklinghausen's disease. And the optic nerve gliomas are usually going to end at the chiasm. Because the disorder is genetic, it's possible for the patients to have bilateral optic nerve gliomas. And it is also possible in some patients that they can arise in or may extend to involve the optic chiasm. 
It's important to remember, however, that pilocytic astrocytomas are generally well-marginated circumscribed lesions, unlike the astrocytomas that occur in adult cerebral hemispheres, which are diffusely infiltrating masses. Patients who have NF1 may also develop enlargement of the globe of the eye, and they can have sphenoid dysplasia. These paired CT images demonstrate a number of features of neurofibromatosis type 1. The patient's right globe is much larger than the left. There is an abnormal formation and dysplasia of the patient's sphenoid bone, creating a secondary or compensatory enlargement of the subarachnoid space between the temporal tip and the bone. Another distinctive feature of NF1 is sphenoid dysplasia, which is typically but not always unilateral. This sometimes creates the appearance of an empty orbit. If we look at the image here, we can see the shadow produced by the lesser wing of the sphenoid and by the greater wing of the sphenoid. However, on the patient's left side, we don't see those shadows, suggesting that they have been destroyed, perhaps by a neoplasm. But in reality, this is a primary dysplasia of the bone. The bone just never forms normally. We can see here, looking at the MR in the same patient, that there is a subcutaneous soft tissue mass, which is a plexiform neurofibroma, another feature associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. The redundant skin thickening in this patient causes the eyelid to droop. We can also see in this patient that there is a cafe au lait spot. Sometimes the skin thickening is so diffuse and extensive that it gives the patient the appearance that their face is melting. So if we look at these two images in two different patients, we can see that although we have this massive swelling, we don't see any cafe au lait spots or cutaneous neurofibromas overlying the subcutaneous plexiform neurofibroma. The cafe au lait macules are flat areas of hyperpigmentation. They're not caused by an increase in the number of melanocytes, but rather by an increase in the size of the pigment particles or the melanosomes. They're variable in size, shape, and color. Some of them are dark, some of them are more pale, as we can see here. This patient also has several subcutaneous neurofibromas. This child illustrates an axillary freckle, which has higher significance because it's in a place where the sun wouldn't normally cause an actinic or sun-related freckle. NF1 has variable expression. Some patients have very mild disease and some patients have severe disease. This appearance is sometimes called fibroma molluscum. The cutaneous neurofibromas may be pruritic because they contain mast cells, and because of their itchiness, the patients may scratch them and cause secondary excoriation and infection. For this reason, they're oftentimes removed from areas where they chafe against the clothing, like the patient's belt line is shown. If you're doing mammography and you hate neuro, you still have to know about NF1. This patient has DCS, but the patient also has multiple cutaneous neurofibromas as a result of von Recklinghausen's neurofibromatosis. I want to talk for a little bit about the deep bright objects seen on MR in patients that have NF1. These lesions are generally invisible on CT scanning, and they were only described in the mid to late 1980s when MR became more prevalent. They are primarily noted as areas of T2 hyperintensity. They can also be hyperintense on T1 weighted images. They most commonly occur in the deep parts of the brain, especially in the deep gray matter like the globus pallidus and its correlating structure in the posterior fossa, the dentate nucleus. It's extremely rare for these lesions to develop into neoplasms. They usually have no contrast enhancement or mass effect. They don't have perilesional surrounding edema, and it's not clear exactly what causes them. They're most commonly attributed to intramyelinic vacuoles, but they've also been described as dysplastic myelination. These deep bright objects are very, very common in some patients uh, who have NF1, up to 95% in some series. 
They typically are most numerous between the ages of four and 12 years of age. They're very rare under the age of four, and they typically begin to fade away on their own over the age of 16. And again, the most common locations are the globus pallidus and the dentate nucleus, but they can also be seen in the midbrain. I like calling them uh, deep dysplastic bright objects or just DBO because it reminds me that they're not neoplasms and that they're located in the deep parts of the patient's brain.